intellectually, when we study things, it's easy to separate them and it makes it neater and cleaner. And we like to separate like languages over here and cultures over here. Language is red, culture is blue, right? But the reality is those two are the same thing. It's hard to talk about one without the other. They are so uh, intertwined and they intersect so much that it's not really language is red and culture is blue. It's really, they're both together and they make purple, right? You had red and blue together, you get purple. So language and culture really is one thing and it is purple uh, because you can't have one without the other. Uh, Noam Chomsky, the uh, famed author and, and professor and linguist, um, once said a language is not just words. It's a culture, a tradition, a unification of a community a whole history that creates what a community is. It's all embodied in a language. And I really think, you know, he nailed it right there. Language and culture are so intertwined, intersected, they cannot hardly be separated. So with that in mind, let's discuss language and culture. If you, if you missed the, the previous video on language itself, you can go back and look at just kind of the principles of language, the, uh, the nature of language, uh, and, and start there. But we're going to focus this video on language and culture and how the two of them intersect and, and work together. So okay, here we go. Language and culture, starting with the fact that language is bound by, uh, context and culture. Language is bound by, it is created by and specific to a culture. Right, so again, I mentioned the, uh, the previous video we did in that, in that previous video in language, we talked about how language is arbitrary and symbolic language has rules and language evolves right, over time. So, uh, and, it, but it is still, it, it has these, these, uh, these things that are true about it, but at the same time, it is bound by and specific to a culture. So let's look at how all the, all three of those things really uh, are true in the way that it, that it also impacts culture. And to do that, we're going to different video. And we talked about this, but the, uh, the old argument and, uh, between do you say pop, do you say soda or is it Coke, right? This is a fairly contemporary map, um, which is really disturbing to me because, um, it should be pop pop is on the, you know, on the, on the decline it looks like, but not in, in my world. Uh, I'm keeping pop alive. So, uh, but we talked about this before, how, uh, you know, language is a big part of culture and even just kind of where you can almost tell what, where somebody's from by what, what they call a sugary carbonated beverage. Is it pop? Is it soda? Or is it Coke? Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, we can look at those rules for language and really understand how culture influences language and is influenced by language uh, by thinking about, okay, language is arbitrary and symbolic. First of all, these are random words. We just made these words up. So, um, so they are just random words and how do, how do we come to, to know pop or soda or whatever? It's just, it's just so random. It's no matter where you're from, where you grew up, where you live. But if you move to a different part here, you're probably going to start saying the other one. If you move to soda world, um, you might start saying soda, um, right? but, uh, so they're, they're, it's just arbitrary, but it is symbolic and it's important for those people who believe in pop or believe in soda or believe in Coke or whatever. Um, but it is symbolic just of, it represents this thing, this idea, right? Um, and so, so it, it holds for culture in that regard. Language also has rules, right? The way that these things are, are used and the way that they're, they're said. So language, um, impacts though, is impacted by culture though, by, by the rules about what it's called and, 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 uh, and how we say it, and it depends on where you're from. And, and so there are rules about, well, from, if you're from here, you say pop, if you're from there, you say soda. Uh, and if you're one of those really weird people that just calls everything Coke, then, um, then, you know, there's that too, but it has rules that go along with it that we're expected to follow. Uh, and then finally language evolves. And this is more interesting to me. This is what I mean by pop is on the decline. If you look at these maps, this represents what terms were used in 1947 versus 2023. And you can see that there's been a distinct change because language has evolved. You've had people from, uh, you know, from um, soda world moving into pop territory and, and bringing soda with them, bring, bring that word soda with them. But mostly you just have a diffusion of people around the country. People are moving more. And also people are, um, media has a, a role in this as well. Uh, if we see people in the media using the word soda more than people pick up on that, you know, if, the, if you're, if a character from your favorite show calls it soda, even though you live in pop world, you could very well start calling it, it soda because, uh, because that's what you see. And that's what, you know, 
It's what becomes important to you in that way. So language evolves over time. It changes. It does not stay stagnant. It's, it evolves. It, it moves. And and uh, so, you know, again, I'm hoping that Pop will have a resurgence here as it continues to evolve. So, uh, But all these things exist within this culture, and they, they impact our culture in the way that we the way that we use language, the way that, uh, the, but it is bound by these uh, different uh, um, things as well, by our, by our cultures, bound by uh, context and culture. Language also, think, uh, it shapes our thoughts. Language shapes our thoughts. Now, we're not talking here about, you know, you get out your tinfoil hat because the government's trying to, you know, send laser beams into your head and tell you what words to think and that kind of thing. We're not talking about that, but we're talking about this fact that language shapes our world. Really, it shapes our thoughts and it shapes our perceptions. It shapes our world. Uh, a lot of this comes back to um, the theory um, that was developed by two researchers um, who were called uh, Saper Wharf, right? And this is a Saper Wharf hypothesis. It sounds like it's out of some uh, science fiction thing, right? Like it's off of Star Trek or something, but but it's not. This was just a, a theory that was initiated by uh, Edward Saper uh, in the early 1900s, who did some studies of Native American languages. And uh, and came up with some conclusions then, and then those were expanded and developed uh, a little more by uh, another researcher in the fifties named Benjamin Lee Worf. So it's now known as the Saper Worf hypothesis, and it really has to do with this idea that sh that language shapes our thoughts and our perceptions, and and has a couple different impacts on us. The first one that they talked about is called uh, linguistic determinism. This is the first part of Saper-Whorf hypothesis, linguistic determinism. And ling linguistic determinism says that language defines the boundaries of our thinking uh, because we cannot conceive of things for which we lack the vocabulary. So if we don't have a word for it, it's hard for us to really uh, understand it and know it and, and believe it's possible or believe it's real or whatever, right? So, we don't, so our language then uh, is, and our, and our perception is defined by what, what language we have to describe something and the words that we have um, that we can put to it. And if it doesn't have a word, then we really have trouble expanding our mind to that. Right? Not, and this isn't exactly a direct connection, but for example, um, did you know, did you know that, that the universe is estimated to have 70 sextillion stars in it? 70 sextillion stars. Now, what is a sextillion, you may ask? And, and that's the real question, because this is, um, we cannot conceive of one sextillion, right? Let alone 70 sextillion. And how many stars that really is? I mean, it's a lot, right? Where I grew up, we would have called it a, uh, to put it friendly, we would have called it a boatload, right? A sextillion is a lot, but we don't, we can't really conceive of that. A sextillion, this is, this is a, a one with 21 zeros after it. So 70 sextillion, this is the number. There are this many stars in the universe, and more probably, right? At least 76 million stars in the universe. Now, what does that mean? I don't know. How do I, how do I know the difference between a billion and a sextillion? My mind can't really conceive of that because it's not something I can really do. I don't have the, the word, I don't have the capacity really to, to understand that lang my, my language really is kind of, uh, and, I'm, and I'm not a math person either, so this is really out of my range. And so my language is really kind of limiting my ability to, to really conceive of, of what that means to have 76 trillion stars in the universe. Um, and, but a more practical example may be that this, this is not the exact, but this is the phone I grew up with. This, this, this could be the phone that was on the wall in the house that I grew up with. Right. I mean, you can imagine this is hanging on the wall. I wasn't even one that sat on the table. We had one of those too, but this was hanging on. This is the primary phone in our, in our, uh, in our house. Now the cord is about, I don't know, 40 feet too short on this one. It had to be long, uh, but this is the phone. And so if you, this is the phone I grew up with for years I'm, I'm through high school. Okay. This is the phone that I had through high school, uh, at least. And then I, and then beyond that, cause I went to college, but if you'd use the word smartphone, what does that even mean? Right back at that time, it, this is this, this phone is not very smart. I have to turn the dial. I have to turn the dial a bunch to get to call somebody, and that's pretty amazing to be able to call somebody just in general. But smartphone, what does that even mean? If you told told high school me, uh, you know, try to explain a smartphone, I don't have the language to to really understand. That's not my vocabulary. I can't understand smartphone. The, the smartphone. This is the first iPhone. It was developed in two thousand seven. It's it was amazing, but it's way different than what we have now. First of all, but um, but we couldn't conceive of that in the nineties when I, when I graduated high school in the early nineties, I couldn't even conceive how I, I wouldn't have been able to understand what you were saying. My, my, I did not have the language for that. Does that make sense? So my world was, was bound in, was boxed in by the language that I had to describe something. 
Okay. Now people break out of that. We develop new words. Obviously we came up with the word smartphone. We came up with all these things as, as we, as we do things, but, uh, but, but the idea of linguistic determinism is that language kind of defines our world. It, it, it establishes the world that we, that we see, that we live in. Right. Um, interestingly, English has some words that don't have direct translation either though, that, that it's really kind of difficult for us to truly, uh, in some ways understand these things. If you if English is your primary language, for example, Wabi Sabi is a Japanese word that means finding beauty in imperfections. It kind of refers to this type of art where they take things that are broken or things that are cracked and they really find an appreciation for it. This is not just, you know, you go to the Goodwill and see something that's yeah, cracked, but it's cute. It's nice. I'll still make some use. I'll just turn that crack to the back. So nobody sees it. No, they, they really embrace this. Wabi Sabi is the idea of embracing these imperfections, right? I don't really have a word for that in English. And I, so it's harder for me to, to really truly understand this. And I'm going to try and pronounce these. I'm going to get the pronunciations for all of these wrong probably, but, but, uh, another word that I think is really interesting is, is, um, I'm just going to say it's, it's forosket. Forosket. It's Norwegian. So you gotta imagine you're Norwegian. You say forosket. Uh, this is the euphoria experienced as you begin to fall in love. The euphoria, that, that feeling of, as you begin to fall in love, they have a word for that. We don't have a word for that. I mean, we would call it like butterflies and things, but it's, it's you know, it's talking about with language, we only have one word for love. So, I mean, I don't have a word to describe the beginning, the euphoria that happens at the beginning of falling in love, but Norwegians do. It's forsket, forsket. Uh, another well, last one here, an example, duende. This one's Spanish. It's a little easier for me. Duende. This is a work of art's mysterious power to deeply move a person. It's really a lot of times connected with flamenco, the dance, the style of dance, flamenco, but just this, the, the mysterious power, not just that it, not just that somebody's moved. We have that word, right? In English moved, somebody's moved, but this is the power of that, a mysterious power of that art to deeply move somebody to do that. That's what Duende means, right? And I just love that. I love that. And, and so, but, you know, but we don't have these in English and it's really, it is in some ways I'm looking at these definitions right now thinking that makes sense intellectually to me, but it's hard for me to kind of imagine that because it's not a part of, uh, of my culture. It's not a part of my l linguistic culture. So it does make it a large, a, a further reach for me, I think in some ways. Um, one last example here for Saber Wharf. This is kind of a, a traditional one, but we think about snow. The, the kind of the traditional example for Saper Wharf hypothesis is the Eskimos have a bunch of different words for snow. I don't know how many, but that's the, uh, the, 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 the principles. The Eskimos have all these words for snow. And why do they have all these words for snow? Right? Well, they have all these words for snow because they need all these words for snow. Right. If you think about it, think about, you know, the, how many words there are for snowy conditions. And then it really depends on how far north you live. The further north you live, the more words you're going to have for this. Because if you live somewhere kind of, where putting on a jacket is the winter for you. Like if in the seventies is winter for you and you have to get out your jacket, you probably don't have a lot of word for snow because you don't have a lot of snow that you're dealing with. Right. So it's not really a part of your world. Uh, it's not something you need to worry about. Um, so you don't have all this word. So it's not really, you're kind of boxed in in terms of your understanding of snow by just calling it snow. Right. I live a little further North and it gets snowy here. We get plenty of snow. We have four seasons here, but um, so we have lots of words for, for snow. But, and they all describe something different, right? Well, is it slushy snow? Is it a blizzard? Is it, is it a flurry? Is it, is it just kind of light powder? I mean, we have, we have a dozen or so words for snow and they all kind of are important. And I'm listening to listen to the weather forecast because I need to know what kind of snow it is. If that's going to impact if I'm going anywhere or, and how I'm going to drive and how long I need to, you know, do I need to add some time or whatever? But then the further north you get, you know, you get into Michigan, Canada, and they get tons of snow. They have more words for snow because it, it impacts their lives more, right? And then you get up, yeah, up to the north where, where snowmen are worried about snow. And then it, it just makes sense that they would have more words for these things. So, but your, your world is kind of determined by, you know, the, 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 the language that you have. That's linguistic determinism. Linguistic relativity is the other aspect of Saper Wharf that we can touch on here. So linguistic relativity, though, says uh, that people from different cultures then will perceive and think about the world in very different ways because of the different languages that they have. Right? So people from different cultures, we have, as I just explained, we have different words that are part of that culture, part of our language in those cultures. And so as a result, those people will perceive the world and think about the world in very different ways because 
of the different language that they have. That's linguistic relativity, how language then shapes our, our idea of the world and our vision, our perception of the world. Okay. It doesn't just, uh, shape uh, language shapes our perception, but then we also do it in reverse. And so, but uh, just for, as an example, think about if you, could, uh, if I gave you the next 30 seconds, how many words could you think of for the word money? Like th that all mean money. If we were coming up with words that mean money, if you're, if you're from the United States and uh, I mean, we could probably easily do a dozen in the next 30 seconds, right? Maybe even more than that. All just things that mean money, right? Cash, moolah, Benjamins, whatever. Um, there's always new words that we're creating for money, right? But, you know, uh, but the, let me ask you a second question then. Right? How many words can you think of that mean love? I mean, we, we really just have the, the one for the most part, right? Uh, because I say I love my wife. I also say I love Taco Bell. I love the University of Michigan. Oh, I love doing this. I love that movie. I loved it. We have all these words for love. We just use it interchangeably. The same word for all these circumstances, right? So with that in mind, we have all these different words for money and just one word for love in our culture, which is, you know, other cultures have lots of words for love that mean different things, right? Um, but if we have one word for love and a bunch of words for money, if somebody, if, you know, an alien comes down, right, we got a little alien visiting us and he's going to get to know who we are just by looking at our language. What's that going to tell him about our language, about our, about our culture? What does that tell him about our culture? Um, well, presumably that money is really important to us because we have a lot of words for it, right? Uh, and, and so money must be very important to us. Love may not be as important, certainly not as important as money, because we only have one word for it. We have a bunch of words for money. Right? Now, instead of an alien, what if it's a child? You're a child growing up in that culture, you know, and, and you're, you're saying to yourself, oh, wow, we have lots of words for money. And I only hear this one word for love. So what does that tell you as somebody who's learning that language and learning the values um, that that language would would pretend, you know, that would that would that would apply. Uh, that's going to tell you that uh, that you need to emphasize money. Right, money is important, and money is important. But so is love, and so so uh, uh, so. What does that tell you? You know, linguistic relativism kind of says okay, you're, you're, the language that you have that you use is going to shape your uh, perception of the world. Right? So we need to be aware of that as well. So anyway. Saber Wharf, there, I mean, there's some arguments for and against Saber Wharf. And, and so, um, but it is an important uh, thought exercise and something we need to consider when we think about language, okay? because language does shape our thoughts. It's, it's, it has a major impact on our perception of the world. Obviously, language varies in cultures, right? In different cultures, we will have different languages, um, sometimes literally. Right? You know, we have English, we have Spanish, we have Chinese, we have whatever. But even in, in you know, if we're all speaking English, we have different cultures. You go from one workplace to another, they're going to have a different uh, set of lingo and different jargon and things that go along with that, right? So language varies um, for cultures as well. Um, but it also varies in the sense of um, uh, speaking versus silence, for example. You know, some cultures really value silence really value that, that type of effective listening. And, but you know, in the United States, again, we're, we're more direct with things We're if you ask me a question, I'm going to give you an answer. And even if you don't ask me a question, I'm probably going to tell you my, my opinion, I'll give you some input, whether you want it or not. Uh, we don't really do well with silence. We'd like to fill that silence with whatever we can, but in other cultures, silence is considered appropriate. It's considered respectful. And so, um, so language will vary in, in terms of how much we should use it. Should we be speaking? Should we be using language? Should we should we use less words and be and be silent more? Right. Um, also, the written versus the spoken word. We talk about language. It can be a written format or, or spoken format. Cultures view that differently. In the United States, we really value the written word. That's why we emphasize contracts. Um, and uh, uh, and so if you you know something's not official until you put it in writing, right? And very specific kind of writing, and it's got to be very detailed. And it's got to have just the right kind of wording and things. So um, the written language, in those sense, in that sense, is very very important in cultures like in the United States. In other cultures, the spoken word is more valued. Uh, a handshake or or a spoken agreement is is every bit as binding, uh, you know, by both legal terms and both and by honor. And uh, as the written word, um, mostly that's that's in older cultures as well, where where they you know they predate the written word, for example. But uh, um, so they really value the spoken word and have held on to that. So whether the, the, that emphasis is placed on 
written or spoken word will vary from culture to culture. So language will vary in a variety of different ways from culture to culture. And then language can be an obstacle. It can be a challenge, right? It can be, it can provide lots of different challenges. Um, so when we use language in ways that are non-specific, for example, like cliches or that are not very interesting, you know, what, you know, kid in a candy store, don't judge a book by its cover. That, that can mean a lot of different things. And over time it becomes so overused that it loses some of its value. Really, if it becomes cliche, that means it kind of has lost some of its inherent value. And and so language uh, can be an obstacle in that way if, when it loses value like that. Uh, and I was just talking about jargon. Jargon can be an issue. If you go to a new workplace and you, you have to learn the language there again, right? I mean, what are some of the shortcut uh, lingo that they use, the jargon that's part of that profession or part of that, that workplace, um, that you need to get to know those things. So language can be an obstacle in that way. It can also be an obstacle if, when people are using slang, right? Um, when I was putting this together, one of our kids came in and he actually left because I, I had a thing for Gen Z slang and, he's, slang and he was asking if I even knew what any of that meant. I said, yeah, I think I got a couple of them, but yeah, not really. I mean, I think I understand goat and sus means suspect, I'm pretty sure. Um, slay, I think is a good thing, right? If somebody slays, that's good. Uh, but the others I don't really understand now. I don't, I don't really get um, the others, so... No, I don't know. And that's an obstacle for me. If, if when, you know, I hear young people talking and they're using words like, I just don't know what it means. Honestly, I just don't, I just don't understand. Um, so it can be an obstacle in that sense too, when we use slang. So what are some of the some more practical impacts of language on culture? And then um, just a couple of things we want to look at quickly here. Um, first of all, naming and identity. Naming and identity. These are, I mean, we name something, that's a, that's a word, right? That's a language. Uh, and when we uh, identify a group using a name, that's language as well. So just looking at it individually, for example, names are important. I can remember my, my brother and his wife struggling for a long time to come up with names. At the time, he was a middle school principal. So every name they came up with for their kids he would say, no, it rhymes with this or no, there's kid that, uh, with, they would call him this or whatever. And so it was always, you know, the, the naming is very important though. Naming is very important. People, you know, parents, you talk to parents, they, most parents do not just draw names out of a hat, right? That they put a lot of thought and a lot of intention behind what you name somebody because it's important. They're going to carry it with them for the rest of their lives. And so we want to give them the best name possible. And so um, naming is, is critically important. And it has so language has an impact on on our culture in that way by the names that we value and the names that we find um, to be suitable. Right. Uh, also, though, in the names of you know group and the identifications for groups, for example, what group do we use or what you know? Think about the labels that we've had for the African American uh, community over the years. Okay, um, and, and again, I'm, I'm posting this as an academic discussion. I hope nobody gets uh, worked up about this, but um, but these are the names that that have been used over the years, you know. And we can see how this has evolved and changed over time, uh, in in a, what I hope is a positive way. Um, and and we could do the same thing for women too. Really, any group you take, any group, and really the the tipping point is when that group is allowed to kind of choose their own name, right? When it's no longer um, people that are part of the out group, the people that are not part of that group that are, that are providing that label, um, that when, when that ceases and when that group, people from that group are allowed to choose their own label, then that really is an important um, part of the evolution of that group and the, and, and their identity. And so identity is important for us in naming and identity is important in an individual basis, but also at a, at a group level. Affiliation is an important impact of language and culture, and this is a very practical thing as well. Um, we use language to affiliate or not affiliate with a group. So, so for example, if we, we were thinking about we're going to join a group, we want to be part of a group, we may take on the language of that group. We call that convergence, right? When we call it convergence, when we intentionally start using the language that is used by people in that group, it brings us together, brings us, makes us part, helps it be, helps us be part of that group, right? And brings us um, together. It shows uh, that we are accepting that group, that we are actively trying to be a part of that group as well. The opposite of that, when we uh, use, uh, intentionally do not use language that that group is using and we, and we, we stay away from it, that's called divergence. Right? We're basically saying, I don't want to be part of this group, so I'm not going to take on the language that this group is using. Okay, so that's divergence, right? So it can be a very, language can be a very strong indication of affiliation, right? So if you are part of the out group, you're not part of that group and you want to be part of that group, then you will um, adopt the language of that group. 
right? If you want to stay outside of that group, stay where you're at, then you would diverge and not pick up the language. But if you want to be part of that group, then you would start using that language to converge. One example of this uh, is the way that the uh, the military uses this. Uh, they use convergence uh, and divergence um, in the military a lot. Uh, I had a friend who went to boot camp and uh, joined the military, joined the army. I'm grateful for his service. He went to boot camp and he came back um, on a little uh, break from boot camp. This makes me laugh still 20 years later, probably. But um, his language had totally changed. He was talking, he no longer went to the bathroom. Every time he went to the bathroom, it was, I got to use the head. I'm going to the head. And he, I mean, just you know, the mess and the head and all these different, the, the military, each branch of the military really has its own language in a sense. And that is not an accident. That is on purpose because they want people to signal that they want to be part of that group. That helps them bring that group together and create this cohesion in that group, starting with just the words that you use for the bathroom and the, and the, the kitchen at the dining hall or whatever, at the mess, right? So uh, that's very intentional on their part. They use language as a way to get people to converge and become part of a cohesive group. And if not, then they demonstrate divergence, which indicates that they may not be suited for that, that service then, because that's not what they want necessarily. So, um, so affiliation language has a huge impact in, in affiliation. Uh, power and politeness, just the language of how we speak to people who, that we think are in a position of power. Um, for example, um, in the United States, we're very um, low power distance culture. Okay, referring again back to an, another video, you can go back and check out the, the different uh, areas of, of culture there. But power distance, the United States is a very low power distance. We're on the left there. Everybody's kind of on the same level. So even if I were to talk to the president or talk to the, uh, the president of the university where I work or talk to the president of the United States or whatever, I mean, I would show them respect, but I could talk to them. I'm, I wouldn't have any hesitation about just speaking to them and speaking my mind and, and saying those things um, because they're just people in the end, right? You respect the, the, the office and the position, um, but in the end, they're just people. And so they're owed respect that we owe um, people in general, but, but they're just people, right? As opposed to in a high power distance culture, you would use an entirely different language if you even spoke to them at all uh, because there's just a sense of there's a separation there. Right. So um, it affects you know power and politeness and the way that we approach uh, how we use language in that regard. Uh, and then you kind of already touched on this a little bit, but kind of the sexism and racism language, obviously, is a big part of expressing sexism and racism. And, and so um, uh, so we um, language we know is is a factor there. It's also hopefully a factor in helping to resolve those things and, and eliminate them in our culture, one would hope. But uh, but we know that language is, is an important, has an important role in, in sexism and racism. And so we have to um, acknowledge that as well, the, the impact that it has there. Okay. Hopefully this helps you understand then a little bit about, you know, just the, the idea of, of uh, language and the impact that it has on culture when we come across somebody who's from a different culture. We need to understand that not only may their literal language be different, but the way that they use language and and the way that they approach language and their, their conception of language and, the, and the, their perception of the world based on uh, the language that they have and that they use is going to be very, very different. So language is very impactful in an intercultural sense as well. Hopefully uh, this has helped you understand this a little bit. If you have questions about language and culture and, and where they intersect and anything related to that, please feel free to email me. I'd love to hear from you there. In the meantime, I hope that, that you found this instructive and, and have a new appreciation for the important, really critical role and, and uh, impact that language has on uh, culture.